God, once again, we are in awe of your work through your Son. Thank you that we have a great high priest who has made in himself a perfect sacrifice and that we are now those of us who have repented and of our sins and placed our faith in you. We are now reconciled and we have that precious, wonderful hope in you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, for the cancellation of debt, for the newness of life, for the completeness in Christ that we now have. And Lord, this morning now as we come to your word again, I pray that you would give us soft, moldable hearts to see what we must about you. Lord, to see what we must about ourselves, that we would repent well where we need to, and that we would rejoice rightly in your work where it is evident. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, please open your Bible to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning, Colossians chapter 2. A number of years ago, a woman called into a radio show to vent her frustration with an issue that she saw as a very real problem. She'd already reached out to the local newspaper and news station and hadn't gotten anywhere. In a year's span, she had been involved in three separate car accidents, where shortly after passing a deer crossing sign on a highway, she ended up hitting a deer. This was becoming a real problem for the motorists and the deer. Her problem as she called into this radio show, was that she believed it was irresponsible placement of deer crossing signs that were placed on busy highways that were indicating to the deer where they should cross. She believed it was cruel to direct the deer to these busy highways and that a better option would be to place the deer crossing signs in school zones so that the deer would cross where it was far less crowded and busy and vehicles were moving more slowly. The radio host clarified, it sounds like you think these signs are for the deer and not the motorists. She replied, well, yeah, and I just think it's irresponsible where they place these signs. This story isn't too far off from when years ago I was working at a bank inside of one of the banking centers and someone called in. They spoke with a teller and after not getting what they wanted and becoming irate, they asked to speak to a manager and when I got on the phone, they proceeded to complain because they were in urgent need to make a deposit and they could not understand why we would refuse their cash deposit by the means of fax. It was that day when I learned that the customer is not always right. <laughs> we all have those moments where our senses are out of whack. Some more out of whack than others. And for some of us, those moments come at more public times than others. My life can attest to that. Yet neither these, of these irrational, illogical moments comes anywhere close to the notion that something different or more than Jesus' work in the gospel is necessary to both save sinners from their sins and enable the sinner to press on in their new life in Christ. To think that something outside of Christ's provision is needed is absolutely ludicrous, and yet there is a very real temptation to give an ear to false teaching, to teaching that would advocate otherwise. To disregard our spiritual senses and to even be taken captive by worldly elementary teachings that would seek to, as Paul says in verse 4 of chapter 2, delude us with persuasive arguments. When thinking rightly about the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, it is absurd to think that something more or other than Jesus is necessary. Yet there is no greater threat to your spiritual life, to my spiritual life, to our spiritual life than what we believe about Jesus. Jesus. 
Paul knows this. And that is why Paul has been spending so much time putting forth the greatness of Jesus Christ. He's doing this in order that the Colossians would be fortified in their faith against these false teachers who were advocating false doctrines. In chapter 1, Paul has been primarily addressing the false teaching by setting forth what is true about Christ. Then in chapter 2, up to this point, he's been really warning the Colossians against these false teachers and these false teachings. And now in our section today, Paul's going to dive into the specifics and narrow down in regards to what the false teachers were teaching and that they are to be rejected as we hold fast to Christ. So let's read together Colossians 2. We're going to read verses 16 through 23. Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Verse 20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Holding fast to the sufficiency of Christ, we are to reject the attacks of false teachers. Holding fast to the sufficiency of Christ, reject, reject the attacks of false teachers. There are false teachers present in Colossae who are posing a very real threat to the believers and they are to be rejected in light of the sufficiency of Christ. There was either a false teacher who had gained a following or a number of false teachers who were proponents of this false teaching. Nevertheless, the language Paul uses indicates that there were specific people in mind who were teaching these falsehoods and they were to be rejected. They were trying to draw people away from the truth, from Christ. And this false teaching has been referred to over the years as the Colossian heresy. This teaching claimed it was teaching the way of Christ or even a deeper understanding of the way of Christ, yet had actually rejected Christ as the head. They did not altogether deny Christ, but sought to dethrone him and rob him of his rightful place of preeminence. They both diminished the person of Christ, as we saw in chapter 1, and in our passage we see there were distortions to Christian living, looking to add things in addition to Christ. And in this, we see that doctrine is never divorced from our daily living. What we believe has implications upon how we live. What we believe has implications upon our personal godliness. Similar, similarly, false doctrine has ethical implications on the lives of those who would be persuaded by it and thus must be rejected. Paul, in calling the Colossians to reject this false teaching, really crystallizes the falsehood that was being perpetuated. And so, holding fast to the sufficiency of Christ, reject the attacks of false teachers. Well, the first attack of the false teachers that we see in our passage that is to be rejected is this. Number one, reject the legalistic judgments of false teachers. Reject the legalistic judgments of false teachers. Look at verses 16 and 17. Paul says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance 
belongs to Christ. Now, in the preceding verses to what we are looking at this morning, Paul has set forth the wonderful reality of eternal life found in Christ. That Christ offers the forgiveness of sins, that he accomplishes this, and the complete victory over spiritual forces has all been accomplished in Christ. Then in verse 16, Paul says, therefore, do you see that at the beginning of verse 16? And then he draws implications from this work of Christ. In light of Christ's sufficiency, therefore, reject this false teaching. And he begins by saying, therefore, no one is to act as your judge. And this isn't hypothetical for the Colossians. There were false teachers who were acting as their judge. This acting as your judge is taking place. It is in progress as the false teachers were imposing judgments on the believers with regard to various observances that Paul is about to address. To act as your judge here is to pass unfavorable judgment upon or to criticize or to find fault. It's not that they were being impartial judges, passing impartial judgment but rather that they were bringing upon them negative conclusions based off of their conduct and belief. They were imposing judgments, criticizing and finding fault in the Colossian believers. And Paul says, no one is to act as your judge as ones who are complete in Christ. And then Paul enumerates these matters that the false teachers are not to hold judgment over. And there are five of them that we see in these verses. The first two go together and are in verse 16. He says, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink. In regard to food and drink. In light of the following points regarding festivals, new moons, and Sabbath days, all being distinctively Jewish matters, it's most likely this reference to food and drink is likewise referencing Old Testament regulations regarding eating and drinking. These false teachers were passing judgment and holding over the Colossian believers standards regarding food and drink that were wrong, not necessary. It seems the false teachers were putting some sort of ungodly standard or regulations regarding food and drink on the church in Colossae. It is possible it was regarding fasting or total abstinence of specific food or drink as a means of gaining greater spiritual insight. The next matter Paul addresses is also in verse 16. He says, let no one pass judgment in respect to a festival. And Paul is referring here to the annual Jewish festivals where there would be celebrations. These included things such as Pentecost and Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, or the Festival of Lights. Paul also references the new moon, which points to religious observances regulated by the lunar cycles. And then he says the Sabbath day, which was the weekly religious observance of the Jews on the seventh day of each week. And Paul makes clear the believer is not bound to these regulations or observances in verse 17. Look again at verse 17. Paul says, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. These observances and rituals are related to the former order of things, yet in Christ, the substance has arrived. Paul, by saying these things were a shadow, is indicating they had no substance ultimately, but were indicators of something else that possesses mass and dimension. Christ is that substance. Thus, the regulations others might add or look to are not of substance of the reality God had planned for believers in Christ. Christ is the substance. These other things were not to be depended upon as that which provided spiritual aid for the believer, but they were pointing to that which holds substance, who is Jesus. Now, what this is not saying is to reject clear instruction from Scripture. We are to cling to Scripture. These regulations might add or look like they are of substance, but ultimately the substance is only found in Christ and things pertaining to Christ. 
Thus, the regulations others might add or look to are not of substance of the reality God had planned for believers. And Paul in verse 9 of chapter 2 has declared that in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Christ is the substance. And these false teachers were detracting from what was a shadow of Christ as if they possessed continued substance. These are legalistic judgments that would hold up unbiblical standards as re- of religious practice as necessary, and they would not look to Christ. In fact, to think something outside of Christ is necessary to attain to spirituality, that is human works. And to think that these human works could somehow supplant or add or fill up what is lacking in Jesus is heresy. It is legalistic judgments that they are bringing upon these believers. The believer is complete in Christ. Now, as we consider this, Paul is about to give clear instruction regarding what the believer's life should look like. And so, this advocating for observances and legalistic judgments does not free us from being bound to Scripture's instruction about how we should live our lives. But the difference is these false teachers were advocating this false doctrine as necessary to accomplish the work that only Christ could accomplish. Whereas Scripture spells out with clarity that Christ has accomplished everything. Everything is found Christ. And yet in light of who Christ is and what he has accomplished, the believer is called to live in light of Christ's work. So where there is clear instruction from Scripture that we encourage one another towards, that is not legalistic judgments. That is faithful obedience where it is looking to the accomplished work of Christ in the cross to provide all that we need for salvation before the Lord and to provide all that we need for obedience to the Lord. And then we press on diligently, intentionally towards obedience for the glory of our great God who has rescued us and saved us and reconciled us and forgiven us and made us complete in him, in Christ. We too must reject legalistic judgments from false teachers, those that would declare that the gospel is not enough, those who would place some sort of practice or cause or agenda upon the believer as the means of them attaining or being spiritual before the Lord. You see, there is a difference in advocating for what is right in light of God's word and advocating for what is man-made and adding to God's word and has some sort of false view of being extra spiritual. There's a difference in advocating for scriptural principles to be lived out in light of the gospel's work in one's life and demanding another to pick up your particular cause as the required spiritual expression of one who is truly devout. Many in the social justice movement have done this very thing, holding legalistic judgment over other believers, declaring that to not embrace their cause is to, in practice, reject Christ. This is divisive. It is a form of legalism, and it is the kind of thinking that elevates social causes to the standard of Christian conduct, and it is unbiblical. Now, for clarity, many of those social causes are not unbiblical, and the believer should have the freedom to advocate for righteous causes in a godly manner. But there's a big difference in the freedom to concern ourselves with specific causes in response to what God has accomplished for Christ, for us, in Christ, for us, and holding judgment over others that they must also pick up our cause. Do you understand the difference? Many, I'm certain, who advocate for various social causes do so with a desire to see God glorified, and this is good, but when we hold and pass judgments on others who are not embracing our particular cause to the degree that we think they should, as if that is somehow a reflection upon their actual spirituality or devotion to Christ, obedience to Christ, or maturity in Christ, we are 
doing harm to the body of Christ. So, hold fast to the sufficiency of Christ. Reject the attacks of false teachers. First, reject the legalistic judgments of false teachers. And next, we see number two, reject the counterfeit spirituality of false teachers. We see this in verses 18 and 19. Number two, reject the counterfeit, the false spirituality of false teachers. The false teachers were holding on to Jewish religious practices, but here we see they were also combining that with mystical spirituality. There was a false spirituality, a a counterfeit spirituality that looked to experiences, and in so doing, Paul instructs the Colossians to not let anyone keep defrauding them of their prize. Look at verses 18 and 19. He says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Let no one defraud you of your prize. The verb here gives the idea of an umpire deciding against someone who is competing in a manner that they are robbed of the prize for which they were competing. This term came to be used more generally to decide against someone, to decide against them or to condemn them. the, The false teachers were making up rules that were unbiblical and were robbing the Colossians of their prize. By looking to things outside of Christ as the means of heightened spirituality, they were being robbed of the prize of fullness of life in Christ, in union with Christ. They were being directed to the very things they were delivered from in Christ. These elementary principles of the world, Paul references in verses 8 and 20, the believer is dead to, and yet these false teachers were holding judgment and condemning the Colossian believers for not holding to them and thus defrauding them of their true prize of a life lived in union with Christ. And Paul says, don't let anyone defraud you of your prize, and then gives four phrases that unpack this false spirituality that they were teaching. The first is by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. Paul says delighting in or taking pleasure in two things, excuse me, delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. And Paul makes a close link between these two things by using the preposition he does. First is self-abasement. This word could also be used for humility or self-mortification, and here it is obviously a false humility. And he says in the worship of angels, the false teachers were setting forth a system of belief that viewed God so high and lofty and removed from humanity that he is unapproachable in any direct fashion. Thus, in a false humility, they advocated for greater so-called humble demonstrations of spirituality by going through angelic beings. This view has the potential to be compelling, being masked in a potentially commendable virtue, yet in reality, it lowers the view of Jesus and elevates created beings. No angelic mediator is needed between God and man as Christ is exclusively the perfect mediator between God and man. And any religion that advocates the necessity of a mediator between God and man outside of Jesus exclusively is a false religion and rejects the true work of Jesus. The glorious truth of the gospel is that in Christ, the believer has access to God. There is no need for a priest, no need for a saint, no need for anyone else to be the means for access to God as the believer has direct access to God through Christ. And then the next phrase is taking his stand on visions he has seen. This is to stand upon or base one's authority on or be preoccupied with as if it were authoritative. The visions he has seen. The word for what he has seen provides emphasis that the the vision was an extreme vision, burned into his memory. It is clearly a, a powerful experience which then dominated one's thinking and speech. 
And this experience intensely led to an authentication of these false claims and teachings. Listen, have you ever, have you ever not been able to reconcile your own extreme spiritual experience with something in Scripture? Don't reject or even bend Scripture to your experience. We should not give weight to our own personal experiences over and above God's clear teaching in Scripture. God's word is what holds authority. These false teachers were looking to their extreme, mind-boggling experiences that they had and holding them up as authoritative. We don't need to be ashamed if we don't have a response for somebody else's compelling experience. We can trust God. We can cling to Scripture. We can submit ourselves under God's Word as it is what is trustworthy. Paul next says, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Don't be defrauded of your prize by those who are arrogant or prideful or puffed up without cause in their fleshly mind. They are claiming a superior spirituality, and yet all they reveal is a fleshly depraved mind. The Colossian heresy being taught seems to be synchronistic, a synchronistic mixture of Judaism and other religious notions most likely taken from Greek mystery religions. And they present themselves as superior and puffed up, but there is nothing worthy of such esteem as they are all revealing the reality of their own fleshly mind in their self-exaltation. And again, we should be warned to not be enamored by the next new thing that comes up, claiming greater spiritual insight, greater spiritual experience, greater spiritual understanding. We should bring our hearts back to the same old gospel, which is superior in every way to any other message that could ever be presented. Hold fast to Christ. And then in verse 19, Paul gets at the heart of what these teachings reveal. He says, don't let anyone keep defrauding you of your prize as these ones are not holding fast to the head. They're claiming spiritual wisdom and superiority, and yet they're rejecting the headship of Christ. Look at verse 19. He says, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. In chapter 1, verse 18, Paul made clear Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And here Paul expands on this, stating that Jesus is the head and from him the whole body is supplied and held together and grows with a growth from God. These false teachers have not held tightly to Jesus, and to reject the head, to lose sight of Jesus, is to reject direction and communication and ultimately spiritual life and unity. Christ is fully sufficient and is the source of spiritual life and nourishment. And so reject the false spirituality. Reject this counterfeit spirituality of the false teachers, knowing that that which is spiritually beneficial comes from and through Christ and Christ alone. And notice that it is through the head that is by Christ that the body is supplied and held together and grown. True unity and spiritual growth flows from a submission to and embracing of Jesus. That's what we should long for. That's what we should long for in our church in our relationships with one another, not worldly relations that find common ground at a basic horizontal level, but linking arms, looking up to the greatness of Jesus Christ. We must hold fast to the head. Lastly, reject the attacks of false teachers. Number three, Reject the ascetic decrees of false teachers. We saw, number one, reject the legalistic judgments of false teachers. Two, reject the counterfeit spirituality of false teachers. And lastly, number three, reject the ascetic decrees of false teachers. 
Now, the heart of this section of these verses in 20 through 23 is in the question in verse 20. Do you see it there? Paul says, why do you submit yourself to decrees? These decrees or commands or ordinances are being laid down by false teachers in Colossae. These commands of self-denial or self-mortification, that is, ascetic practices address the external but are of no spiritual value. And Paul says, Live, living your life in this manner where you are looking to these things is to live as if you were still spiritually dead. Living in this manner is to live as though you were still spiritually dead, not living in light of the fact that you died with Christ to the elementary or basic principles of the world. Look at verse 20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees? Paul says, if, but it is understood since you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, and you remember from last week these elementary principles of the world are the basics of human thinking, the ABCs of human thinking, and the false teachers were claiming a new special wisdom and spiritual insight, and Paul puts them in their place saying, this is the same old trick, the same old attack on truth, and it's basic human fleshly thinking. This death has taken place in union with Christ and the believer has been freed from this fleshly, trivial, worldly thinking and actually now has been raised up with Christ, made alive by Christ and has true spiritual insight in Christ. And so in light of this, why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees? Since you have died to worldly thinking and practices, why do you submit yourself to worldly thinking and practices? And in one sense, we do live in the world. We physically exist in this world. Yet in chapter 3, verse 3, Paul is going to assert that our life is hidden with Christ and God. And we already saw in chapter 1, we are now citizens of the kingdom of God's beloved Son. And though we live in this world, our life is outside of this physical world and defined by the reality that we are unified with Christ. Therefore, reject these decrees or commands of the false teachers. And what are these decrees? What are these commands that are being set forth by the false teachers. We'll look at verse 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And in verse 22, Paul says, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. So Paul gives three examples of these decrees, and within Paul's rapid fire uh, explanation of these decrees, there's a, a tone of, of mocking that these Decrees are even being given. The decrees that Paul sets forth are do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch. Handle, taste, and touch. The first and the third words are close to synonyms. Handle communicates to take hold of, where touching seems to communicate the slightest encounter. And while it seems Paul is moving from full engagement to the slightest encounter, from a moral awareness level, it moves from the least sensitive, do not handle, to the hypersensitive, don't even touch. Then in verse 22, we see that these decrees have to do with perishable things, physical things, most likely food and drink. These things are destined to perish, so don't base your spiritual well-being on physical, temporal means. One writer said it this way, never hang matters of eternal weight on temporal hooks. These commandments are not in accordance to the Lord, but are in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men. And this, again, is teaching of a basic worldly nature. In verse 23, Paul closes this section. Look at verse 23. He says, These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Paul concedes that these false religious practices 
practices, though elementary and having no spiritual value, have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion, or more literally, self-willed worship. Paul says the self-abasement, this is self-imposed ascetic practices and severe treatment of the body. This is self-inflicted pains to the physical body. While on a human level, outwardly, these actions may look impressive. Yet they are no value, there is no benefit or usefulness spiritually for those practicing such things. These outward actions don't ever get to the heart and are actually reflections of self-willed spirituality that rejects Christ, looks to self, and ultimately have no value against fleshly indulgence. Ultimately, you are trading one fleshly indulgence for another and gaining no spiritual value. So because Christ died, you have been forgiven. Your debt has been canceled. And now because he was raised, your future is secure. You have been raised with him. So don't exchange the freedom you have been given through Christ for the bondage of falsehood. Don't exchange the substance for that which is a mere shadow. What can a false teacher or a false doctrine offer you that Christ has not already given you? The believer is complete in Christ having union with Christ. And false teachers offer nothing but burdens and affliction, empty promises, false hopes. But Christ gives salvation, grace, mercy, true hope of eternal glory, the joy of eternity with him. And in him, the believer is found complete. All because of his great work. Because of the love of Christ, we can live not under the bondage of man-made rules, but we have the freedom to live in holiness in response to God's great work in Christ. What a precious gift. We need to remind ourselves of the privilege and joy to walk in obedience to Christ. Have you ever, have you ever been at a crossroad and you had to choose either obedience to Christ or in that moment get what you want? And you, and you submitted to your conscience in that moment, praise the Lord, by his grace, and you did what was right, but you, you kind of felt like you were having to, to give up what you really wanted, what was really enticing, what seemed really good. You never lack any good thing when you choose obedience to Christ, true obedience to Christ and his word not feigned obedience, not moral conformity for the, for the effect of outward spirituality, but true loving obedience and submission to Christ in response to who he is and what he has done in the gospel. As we close, where are you giving an ear to false teaching that would say Christ is not enough? Are there areas Where have you shifted your sights away from Christ? Maybe this, have you turned to Christ, trusting in him fully, or have you up to this point looked outside of Christ for solutions to your spiritual problems? Maybe you've been content to do the church thing, come on Sundays, sing the songs, sit and listen, or maybe space out and go home and just live a morally conformed life and been content with that, I would plead with you, don't be content with that. Submit your life to Christ. Turn to him in faith and repentance, trusting in Christ's all-sufficient work in the gospel on the cross to take upon himself the wrath and the judgment and the penalty for your sins that you deserved and to fully satisfy God's righteous wrath against you and to offer to you forgiveness of sins and fellowship with him. If you would consider doing this, I would ask you, reach out to me, to any one of the pastors so that we can talk with you more about what a life complete in Christ, reconciled to Christ, and union with Christ looks like.
We don't need anything more than Christ. We don't need anything other than the gospel. It is truly astonishing, and to think that something else needed is ludicrous, nonsensical, foolish. We must be properly awed and captivated by the amazing love of God in his son Jesus, and we must hold fast to him always. Let's pray. Father, once again, as we have looked at your word this morning, we are awed by your greatness, by your sufficiency, by your great work in your son, by his supremacy. Lord, I pray that we would hold fast to Christ, that we would look to him only as the source of, of salvation and strength before you and that we would live wholly devoted to him. Guard us. Guard us from legalistic practices. Guard us from being impressed by false spirituality. Guard us from adding standards and practices that don't actually look to Christ but simply have a mere outward appearance of spirituality and help us to honor Christ in all that we do, clinging to him, marveling at him. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.